So this is the book I've been reading, obviously, and um, hypothetically, there's a way I can show you what I'm reading, uh, but I didn't figure out that camera angle. But I wanted to, to share with you, I was in a chapter yesterday on initial divisions within the Methodist Church, and of course, the Afri African Methodist Episcopal Church came out of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was led by Richard Allen, and um, he belonged to a church called St. George's Church in um, Philadelphia, and they had a really unfortunate episode. He was, uh, he was a, a freed slave. His story is actually incredible. He, uh, over a prolonged witness to his slave owner, actually converted his slave owner to Christianity, and then uh, uh, the, the slave owner let him buy his, his own freedom. So he went into ministry in the Methodist Episcopal Church and was part of this uh, church in Philadelphia, St. George, where um, they did a series of improvements, and then whenever the, the building was nicer, the black folks tried to worship in there the way that they always had, and during a time of prayer, trustees came and like bullied them out of their spots. So they left and started their own church. It wasn't their own denomination yet. They started their own church called Mother Bethel Church, I believe. And um, it was really interesting. Yeah, here's Mother Bethel Church. So it's the, the longest held piece of property by a black person in the United States. And it was just a really crooked thing that happened because they started their own space where there wasn't this racial animosity and black people could be treated as, as first-class citizens. And uh, then uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church just couldn't leave them alone. The, the local elders kept insinuating themselves and asserting their right to the property. And then there was actually a very unfortunate event where, um, let's see, where is, he talks about it in here, where, uh, so Alan preserved, well, okay, so this is on page 120. Once white leaders recognized the extent to which the black congregates at Mother Bethel refused to submit to white Methodists any longer, they sued for control of the church. Refusing, so they had previously, yeah, I, I should have told you about the African supplement. Bethel's relationship with the Methodist Episcopal Church was always complicated. Allen shrewdly used the connection with the Methodist Episcopal Church for protection and legitimacy, intending to, quote, create an interdependent relationship with white Methodists while maintaining black autonomy. In 1805, James Smith, a Methodist Episcopal elder, asserted the right to complete control over the church building. This church building that that Allen had uh, left or to form, yeah, left uh, St. George to form with other black people, and they paid for the whole thing. Well, they were using the name Methodist Episcopal, so they had the right over the building. Is this sounding familiar? Allen recounted that Smith, quote, waked us up by demanding the keys and books of the church and forbid us from holding any meetings except by order of him, end quote. After seeking legal advice, Allen discovered that the Articles of Incorporation they had signed, which had been drawn up by the Methodist elder Ezekiel Cooper, meant Bethel actually belonged to the White Conference and not the members who had paid for the building. Allen was further advised that Bethel could revise the Articles of Incorporation by a two-thirds majority vote of Bethel's members. He then called a congregational meeting where the new Articles of Incorporation were passed, quote, before the elder knew anything about it, end quote. The result was called the African Supplement, and it revised Bethel's Articles of Incorporation, resolving any questions about control of the church so it was clear that the trustees of Bethel Church owned the church and controlled access to it. So anyway, whenever it became clear that the whites weren't in charge, they sued for control and uh, refusing to acknowledge the validity of the African supplement, they also decided to sell the church at public auction on uh, June 22, 1815. Can you imagine how infuriating that would be if you left because you were being treated as a second-class citizen, and then they sued for control of your building and then just auctioned it off, just sold it. And that is exactly what's, oh, it's not exactly what's happening in the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> Conservatives have not been treated as despitefully as blacks were in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, they have been treated despitefully. They have been um, 
excluded from positions of authority and influence. Uh, they have been uh, steamrolled, but still it's not on the same level. But even so, what's happening now is that the denomination is going to be taking over their buildings. It's already happened in some places and then sold at public auction uh, for uh, or sold to private entities for profit. So um, also it, what we're seeing is even if they've taken legal action to claim the property, courts are, are not acknowledging a lot of efforts that they've made to claim their own property. So Allen determined to control the only thing he could control. He retained the church by being the highest bidder at the auction. His ability to pay 10000 $125 for Bethel, and the rental lots near it shows his foresight. It also shows that he was amassing lots of money. I looked up how much money that's worth nowadays. It's like over $220,000 by today's standards. So he was apparently doing quite well. Um, Allen's biographer described that amount as a fortune for many people of any class or color. And Allen used the money to buy back perhaps the most important black institution for all of America. So anyway, the Supreme Court got involved, said they owned it. Even after this, they still maintained their relationship with the Methodist Episcopal Church, which is nuts to me. They didn't separate entirely for some time still. But uh, Watson put in here a really great quote as to why it was that uh, Reverend Allen felt so strong about maintaining his connection to the Methodist. Here's the quote. <clears throat> Notwithstanding we had been so violently persecuted by that elder, we were in favor of being attached to the Methodist connection. For I was confident that there was no religious sect or denomination that would suit the capacity of colored people, black people, um, as well as the Methodists. Can you imagine this? Like nowadays black people are a, a huge minority in Methodism, but Watson talks about how uh, in, in urban centers, uh, black people came to Methodism in a higher proportion than white people. It was a great fit for them theologically. Um, for the plain and simple gospel suits best any, for any people. For the unlearned can understand and the learned are sure to understand. And the reason that the Methodist is so successful in the awakening and conversion of the colored people, the plain doctrine and having a good discipline. So this totally fits with a lot of things that I've been saying, you know, having a plain delivery of the gospel, not getting fancy at all, um, having good doctrine and discipline, he agrees this was really good, not just for mainline people, upper middle class white folks, but for lower income minorities. It, it was the good faith for all demographics. He says the Methodists were the first people that brought glad, glad tidings to the colored people. I feel thankful that I, ever I heard a Methodist preach. We are beholden to Methodists under God for the light of the gospel we enjoy. For all other denominations preach so high flown that we were not able to comprehend their doctrine. Sure am I that reading sermons will never prove so beneficial to the colored people as spiritual or extemporaneous preaching. He's saying the, the highfalutin fancy uh, denominations were known for reading their sermons. He says extemporaneous preaching is the way to go. He says, I'm well convinced that the Methodist has proved beneficial to thousands and ten times thousands. It is to be awfully feared that the simplicity of the gospel that was among them 50 years ago and that they conform more to the world and the fashions thereof, they would fare very little better than the people of the world. The discipline is altered considerably from what it was. We would ask for the good old ways and desire to walk therein. I love that quote, and, and Watson does some great analysis on that and, and talking about the trends that were already happening towards respectability um, in the denomination. And that's a trend that, of course, has continued, and that's why the United Methodist Church chose to liberalize and, and throw their lot in with the worldly LGBTQ agenda. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing in the seminaries. And then there's a legitimate question to be asked of if uh, grassroots leadership is up to the task of keeping these things in check, or if we're going to continue to see this pattern of building something, having it co-opted, and then leaving and building something else. That seems to have been going on for some time. That was in the case of Richard Allen. He had to leave and start his own denomination. That's in the case of the Global Methodists. We've had to leave and start our own denomination. I am not in favor of continuing this pattern. Um, you know, For those of you who saw my interview with Redeemed Zoomer, uh, Richard Ackerman, he he is gung-ho against this. There's just this question of what do we do about it? 
And I think the answer has to be that the grassroots learns to operate in such a way that is not so focused on itself, i.e. connectionalism. And if you didn't see my Substack article on connectionalism, I think that especially the Global Methodist Church has to create a polity now where we are regularly watching over <clears throat> not just individuals in the church, but the institutions that the church funds. And if it can't bring itself to do that, then um, you can just go ahead and kiss the GMC goodbye and any other thing that we build together. So what's before us is to learn from our history, whether we're talking about Richard Allen's history, the history of Boston University School of Theology and other liberal institutions that uh, Methodists failed to keep in check. Now is the time to really change how we do local church. And that means that we have to be much more connected with what's going on outside of the local church.